Okay, electrolysis, what is it? What is it used for? Well, it's a way of obtaining pure substances from a molten substance, that is, it's melted, it's liquid, or aqueous salt. This is in solution, it's dissolved by passing a current through it. Okay, so let's deal with something that's molten first, shall we? Let's take lead bromide, PBBr2. Now, what do you know about lead bromide? Well, first of all, it's ionic. It's an ionic compound, and it needs to be an ionic compound in order for current to flow. And that's because the ions move. Because in lead bromide, we have PB2 plus and two lots of Br minus, they can move. And how do we get them to move? Well, we have two electrodes. And usually when we have electrodes, they're made out of carbon. They're just sticks of carbon that we stick in the molten mess that is our lead bromide. And again, it has to be molten because otherwise the ions can't move. So what do we have here? Well, we have a battery or a power supply, whatever, connected to our two electrodes. We have two special names for these. So we call the positive electrode the anode. The way I think about it is we have a plus. That means add usually, anode. That's the way I remember it anyway. And this is what we call the cathode. It's the negative electrode. They're both electrodes, but we give them special names. That means that this electrode is positively charged. This electrode is negatively charged. And so inside the molten lead bromide, we have our PB2 plus, and we have our Br minuses. Okay, there's going to be two lots of that per lead, but it doesn't matter too much. Now, because this is positively charged, which electrode is it going to be attracted to? It's going to be attracted to the cathode. Opposites attract. Similarly, for the bromide ion, it's going to be attracted to the anode. The liquid lead bromide is completing the circuit. It's not electrons flowing inside of it, but the ions flowing. But it doesn't matter because current is just the flow of charge, any charge, whether it's negatively charged electrons or ions that are positive or negative. It doesn't matter. Anything that has a charge. So what happens when the lead ion reaches the negatively charged cathode? The lead ion is missing two electrons, but this cathode has plenty of electrons to go around. So what happens? Each lead ion picks up two electrons off the cathode, and that way it becomes neutral. And we can actually write an equation for this. We can say that Pb2 plus picks up two electrons, two lots of E minus, and it turns into just Pb. This is what we call a half equation, or you might see it called an ionic equation. This Pb is now just pure metal, and so whereas the lead was in solution, it was dissolved as it were because it was part of that ionic compound, the lead ions have turned into just lead atoms. And so what happens? Well, we have a lump of lead being produced at the cathode because those ions are getting out of the lead bromide and just turning into lead. What about at the anode then? Br- minus has one too many electrons. And so Br-, minus it goes to the anode. Well, the anode is positively charged. It's missing electrons, as it were. So therefore, the Br- minus gives electron to anode. And it too turns back into a normal atom. And we can do a half equation for this as well. Now, there is some debate over this because you might want to say Br- minus minus an electron, but technically we shouldn't have any minuses in chemistry. So we're going to say, no, the Br minus goes to Br plus an electron. But there's a problem with this because bromines cannot exist by themselves. Lead atoms can, but bromine atoms can't because they must have a full outer shell of electrons. Because lead is a transition metal, it's not quite the same, but bromine must have a full outer shell of electrons. Because of this, they exist diatomically, and pretty much all elemental gases, apart from the noble gases, exist diatomically. So we can't just have Br, it has to be Br2 that's being made. So in order to balance this equation, we have to have two lots of Br- minus going to an anode and producing a molecule of bromine gas and therefore we have to have two electrons being made as well. One thing, we are missing state symbols. I'm going to put liquid in there and solid over there, and we know that bromine is a gas. So actually what you'll see is little bubbles of bromine being made. So this way you can get pure bromine gas and pure lead from 
the ionic compound lead bromide. And this goes for any ionic compound. Another thing as well, now one of these is called oxidation and one of these is called reduction. Which one is it? Even though there's no oxygen involved, what's happening at the anode is oxidation. Why? Because the bromine is losing electrons. So we can say oxidation is loss of electrons. What's happening at the cathode? This is called reduction because the lead is gaining electrons. And so that's where we get the mnemonic from oil rig. Oxidation is loss of electrons. Reduction is gain of electrons. Oil rig, very good thing to remember. At an anode, oxidation always occurs. At a cathode, reduction always occurs. Okay, so what about electrolysis of salt solutions? Now, there are all kinds of different salts, aren't there? Basically, any ionic compound that is dissolved in water that is in solution, we say is aqueous. However, we are going to choose brine for this. That is actual salt water. You know what the sea is made out of. And that is NaCl dissolved in H2O. Now, when a salt dissolves, we say that the ions partially dissociate. What does that actually mean? Well, when we have sodium chloride as a solid, the ions are just associating with each other. They're just touching each other. There's nothing else grabbing their attention, as it were. There's nothing else trying to pull them away from each other. However, when we have a salt that is dissolved in water, put my carbon electrodes in there. And we use carbon electrodes because they're not going to react at all. But when we dissolve sodium chloride in water, the sodium and chloride ions basically not associating completely with each other anymore because they are attracted by the water. You might be thinking, well, hang on a minute, water isn't charged, it's not made of ions either. Well, this is one of those times where we go, well, we have ionic and we have covalent and we sort of say that they're polar opposites, but actually they're two ends of a spectrum. So what happens is that when the salt ions, the sodium and the chloride ions dissociate, so does the water and water kind of splits into hydrogen plus ions and hydroxide ions, OH minus, H2O. So basically, when we have a salt dissolved in water, we have all of the ions from the salt and the ions, as it were, from the water, all just jumbled up together. So this is a little bit more complicated than our lead bromide, isn't it? What's gonna happen in this situation? So let's start off with the anode, shall we? What's gonna go on there? What's gonna be attracted to it? Well, it's gonna be the chloride ions or the hydroxide ions. The question is, which one of these is going to go to the anode in order to be oxidized? Well, you can't have hydroxide ions going to the anode and being oxidized and producing its own compound. I mean, theoretically, you could have H2O2, two lots of these, and you're making hydrogen peroxide, that's what you have in bleach, but that's not what happens. What happens is that it's always the negative ion of the salt that goes to the anode. And uh, we can give it its proper name as well, anion. Anions go to the anode. So what's gonna happen at the anode then? Well, we're going to have Cl minus, and it's going to lose its electron because oxidation is loss. So that's gonna turn into Cl plus E, but again, chlorine exists diatomically, so it needs to be two lots of everything. That's our half equation. And uh, if we put state symbols in there, chloride ions are aqueous, they're in solution, and then we have gas being made. So we have little bubbles of chlorine gas being made there. So what is happening at the cathode? Now you might wanna say, oh, well, it's the sodium. The sodium goes to the cathode and that is reduced. It gains electrons and it turns into sodium metal. But the problem is, is that hydrogen wants some action as well. What we have to take into consideration is how reactive are these positive ions. And we call these cations, by the way, because they go to the cathode. What happens? Well, it's the hydrogen ions that are reduced. So H plus, plus an electron goes to H. Again, hydrogen exists diatomically, so we have to double everything up. But why does this happen? Well, this is because sodium ions are more reactive than hydrogen ions. And so it stays in solution. Basically, if we have hydrogen and another cation, the more reactive one gets to stay in solution. These ions want to stay in solution, as it were. 
And so that means that if they're more reactive, then they have a bigger say of whether they can stay in there or not. So therefore, hydrogen is the one that is kicked out of solution and we have bubbles of hydrogen produced at the cathode. So what does that mean we're left with in solution? Well, we have sodium left over and we have hydroxide ions left over. So therefore we have sodium hydroxide. This is an alkali and that can be used to make bleach and all kinds of different stuff as well. Just by electrolyzing salt water brine, you can get three very useful substances, hydrogen gas, chlorine gas, and sodium hydroxide. Incidentally, if this was say copper sulfate, because copper is less reactive than hydrogen, copper would actually end up being produced at the cathode instead of hydrogen. Speaking of copper, there is one bonus method of electrolysis. You can also use it to purify a metal, let's use copper. Now, instead of having graphite electrodes this time, we're gonna have copper electrodes. But we're going to have one that is pure copper and one that is impure copper. The anode is made of impure copper. Just need to make sure that you hook the battery in the right way around. And this is pure copper. And we have as the electrolyte, and by the way, that's what we call the liquid that is being electrolyzed. We call that the electrolyte. In this case, we can use, let's say, copper sulfate. Now, because this impure copper has loads of other crud in it, as well as just your pure Cu atoms, at the anode, what's happening is that copper is oxidized. The copper in the actual electrode is being oxidized. That means that it is losing electrons. So Cu solid goes to Cu2+, plus. that's aqueous. It's now dissolved in the electrolyte and we have two electrons left over. But if the Cu2 plus is just swimming around, it is going to be attracted to the cathode. And so at the cathode, it gets re-reduced as it were. So basically it just gains those two electrons back and turns into your normal copper atoms. And so we end up with copper building up on the cathode. What happens to all of the impurities in the impure copper? Well, they just fall down to the bottom because they are not going to be dissolved in the solution. They're not going to be oxidized. They're just going to stay as solid and they're going to drop to the bottom. So that's one way that you can use electrolysis to also purify a metal. So I hope you found this helpful. If you did, please leave a like. And if you have any suggestions on what you want me to cover next, leave a comment down below and I'll see you next time.